All right. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. We're a webinar, a webcast, an online show. Um, as I say I'll, I'll often, um, the terminology is up for debate. And discussion but whatever you want to call us we are here live online every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time um, the show is free and open to anyone to watch so if you do have any friends or colleagues you think might be interested in any of our topics we have coming up um, please just let them know they can they can join us uh, we do record the show every week so if you're unable to join us on Wednesday mornings that's fine you can always go to our website and see the recordings of all of our shows there uh, and I'll show you that at the end of the end of this session so you can see where our upcoming sessions are and um, what all our recordings are on there. Um, we do a mixture of things here, uh, book reviews, mini training sessions, um, interviews, demos. Um, basically, our only criteria is anything, if it's library related, uh, we are happy to have it on the show. We have a Nebraska Library Commission staff that sometimes come on and do presentations about things going on here in Nebraska or at the Library Commission, but we also do bring in guest speakers, and that's what we have um, this morning. On the line from us is um, Alex Lent. Good morning, Alex. Good morning. Thanks for morning. having me. Yeah, and he is um, on the East Coast. He is a director, the library director at the um, Millis uh, Public Library in Massachusetts. Millis, did I say that right? Millis, Massachusetts. Yeah. yeah. Um, and he uh, he's got a program he's been doing at his library, as you can see if you're from his you know uh, intro slide, <laughs> title slide here. Um, lending laptop. A lot of many libraries do are lending out laptops and tablets and all sorts of different kind of uh, equipment. Um, to their patrons and users, and he started a program using Linux as opposed to other ones you might get have done. So um, he's going to tell us all about that. So I'll just hand over to you to take it away. Great. Um, well, hi. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm Alex Lent. I'm delighted to be here. This is a really cool thing that you do. Thank I've you. I've watched yeah. a few of the, the older episodes online. Oh, great. <laughs> thank you for thinking of me, and um, thanks for your interest in this topic. It, it has had a big impact on my library, and I think it could have a big impact on some of Nebraska's libraries as well. So um, I am director of the Millis Public Library in Massachusetts. Millis is a town of about 8,000 people. So we're what the ALA refers to as a very small public library, which seems a little bit like a derogatory term. But um, it's just a library that serves less than um, 10,000 people. And we have a lot of those here in Nebraska and in the Midwest as well. So we're, we're, exactly. we know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Not derogatory and, uh, at all. <laughs> Right. Um, and, you know, the ALA could just as accurately refer to these libraries as the standard public library because nearly 60 percent of public libraries in the United States do serve populations of less than 10,000 people. And, yeah, I, I took a look at the, the NLC data, and it looks like the overwhelming majority of your libraries are sort of similar to mine, which is, which is great. It makes me hopeful that the project I'm going to talk about today um, might work well in Nebraska as well. So I'm here to... Uh, so this is a little bit of, about me. If, feel free to, to tag me on your tweets if you have questions. Um, I'm, I'm probably not going to be able to look at them, but um, we can start a conversation afterwards as well. So I'm here to talk about public access technology. Um, this is a project we started just about a year ago, and it's greatly improved um, the patron computing we have in Millis. So the typical public access computer is a desktop computer. I'd say that close to 100% of libraries that have public access computers have desktop computers. If we do a, an image search for library computers, I'm using DuckDuckGo here, not Google, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Um, if you do an image search for library computers, you get dozens and dozens of photos of desktop computers organized more often than not in large banks, like this one here in New Jersey. So there are a few reasons patron computers tend to be desktops and tend to be organized in banks, but they really boil down to cost. Desktops have traditionally been less expensive than equivalent laptops, and putting them in groups makes it easier to manage them because you can have one staff person in charge of all of the computers in your library. So if one person has a question, they're right there. If someone else has a question, they're still right there. It's also easier because if you need to install power outlets or network ports when you're getting your computers, way cheaper to install them in one spot rather than in numerous spots throughout the building. 
So we have desktop computers in Millis too, and we also organize them in banks. We have 14 computers total, eight here in this adult area, and this is sort of a bank, um, and three each in the teen and children's areas. But now we also have laptops. This is one of our laptops, um, and they've been a really great addition. So today my mission is to convince you of three things. First, that laptops are better than desktops when it comes to patron computing. Two, that Linux is a good option for libraries. In fact, I think it's almost obligatory for libraries to use Linux, but that's outside the scope of this presentation. But I'm very happy to talk about that in a little bit. And three, and this is probably the most important one to me, this project really isn't that hard. Before I started working on this, I didn't know how to do most of the things I'm going to talk about here. When I had a question, I looked for answers online, and I deliberately chose solutions that were easy, because I'm, I have some technology skills, but I'm in no way a guru. I'm also, I'm in charge of technology at my library, but I'm also in charge of adult services, and I'm the library director. So a big part of my job is managing my time so that I can take care of all the different tasks assigned to me. So with this project, I needed systems that would work and wouldn't take too much work. It had to be pretty easy. So I really do believe that you, even if you don't think you're a techie, you can probably handle this project. So what is this project? This is the Linux Laptops for Libraries project. Um, and it started when we noticed that we're really busy. We have a new building now. It's about three times larger than our last building, but we're having far more foot traffic, uh, far more circulation. All of our numbers are up. This is just what happens when you have a new building. Um, and desk space is at a particular premium. So it would be useful for us to provide more computers for patrons to use so we wouldn't have to turn people away. Um, but sometimes people want a desk to do not computer work on. Sometimes people bring their own computers to the library. Sometimes people don't need to use a computer at all. They just need a, a desk to do homework or paperwork or to have a meeting or just to sit at. I actually, um, there was a, not long ago, and they did the paperwork to buy their house in town um, at one of our desks, which was kind of cool. So we didn't want to increase the number of computers in such a way that we also had to decrease the number of desks that we have available for patrons to use, because those are two needs, and they're overlapping, but they're not, um, they're not the same need. We also saw groups of patrons, often not all, but not always students, trying to work together at one computer. So they're trying to get their work done and to collaborate, but they're also trying to keep their voices down so they don't irritate the people at other computers who just want quiet. And this, this situation wasn't working for anyone, because you can't be quiet enough that you don't irritate people and still be loud enough to have a conversation. And we also saw people camped for long periods of time at our desktops, watching movies or playing video games. This is fine in terms of our policy, but they're hunched over the desktop and they would probably be more comfortable on a couch with their feet up or in a big comfy chair. So the physical limitations of desktops were a problem and this is what put us on this journey to get Linux laptops. Other spaces in the library were also being ignored because they didn't come with computers and people wanted computers. So we have lots of spaces. We have um, a couple small study rooms that can fit up to three people. Uh, we have, the, we call these cubbies. They're by um, our fiction section. They're very quiet. It's a good place to work. Um, we have, these are sort of traditional reference tables. This used to be our reference section, but now it's our biography section. And we have several living room type spaces. We also have some work tables in our teen room. So our stationary computers were meeting our technology needs, but not our physical needs. We thought to ourselves, wouldn't it be great if we could just have computers that, that we could move from place to place? We briefly contemplated just moving our existing desktop computers into different configurations, but we realized that that would just push the problem back a little bit. Wouldn't it be great if we could put groups of people together in one, um, one group room and give them computers if they needed computers? Um, in the same room, we could also put people um, who want pure quiet than they can get in our open floor plan. So we could satisfy both groups and individuals if we could just let them move where they wanted to move. We could also let people um, 
use computers in a way that's comfortable for them. I know that when I'm working at home, I'm rarely sitting at my desk. You know, I'm usually at my couch or my kitchen table or, um, you know, in my kitchen cooking while on the internet. So we really wanted to let people use computers in the way they wanted to use them. So this project started as a response to space issues, not because our previous computer system was lacking or so we could offer computer classes or so we could have an after-school code camp or even so we could have Minecraft parties, that we do have all of those now. We just wanted mobile computers. And we realized after considering our options that we really needed six things. We wanted a system with a high degree of flexibility, usability, affordability, privacy, security, and we also needed a system that was what I call data E, which just means um, would give us the usage data that we need in order to complete our report and to figure out how often our computers are being used. So we're going to move through this list and address each item on its own. So flexibility and usability together, that told us laptops, because we liked our desktop computers, we just needed to be able to move them. So we figured out that what we wanted in a laptop was something that was as close to a desktop as possible. We wanted a large screen, preferably HD. We wanted a full keyboard, which to us meant keys that were normal sizes and also a keyboard that had a full number pad. We wanted a camera so that people could Skype. We wanted to have a CD and DVD player so people could play uh, movies and listen to music. We wanted lots of USB ports so that we could plug these computers into printers or to scanners or into anything that we think of later, including just thumb drives. We wanted at least four gigs of RAM. So um, four gigs is really the minimum amount of RAM that's acceptable these days in a new computer. It used to be two. A lot of our older computers have about two gigs of RAM. Um, and in a few years, it'll probably go up to eight. But we wanted at least four. We thought we could get away with four. We also wanted a decent processor. But we weren't expecting people to be doing high levels of computer programming or playing resource intense video games. So, you know, a middle of the road kind of office work computer processor would have been fine. We also wanted an SSD, which is a solid state drive rather than a hard drive. Because a solid state drive, as the name implies, is a solid chunk of material, whereas a hard drive is sort of like a record. It spins and um, is more susceptible to damage than a solid state is. But we didn't care how much space was available because we weren't going to be letting people save files to these computers. But we did want decent battery life because we didn't want to go through the hassle of circulating um, power cords with these. And we wanted five laptops. And the reason for that is that we really wanted to um, dive right into this program. And we wanted to have a natural replacement cycle with these computers. So we wanted to get five laptops in 2015 in 2016 and continue that for the next two years and then in 2019 start thinking about replacing or upgrading the laptops. And five was enough that um, it would really have an impact. That's five more laptops, five more computers is, is a big deal when you only have 14 left. And our budget was $300 per computer. This is not a lot of money and it's also a very specific amount of money. And that's because as we approached the end of fiscal year 15, we realized that we were going to have about $1,500 left over in our operations budget that we could use um, really in any way. But if we didn't use it, we would have to give it back to the town. So we decided to launch our computer program uh, project right away. So we bought five of these computers. This is a Toshiba Satellite C55. It's, um, essentially an entry-level computer. It costs about $250 on Amazon. Amazon is really great because it has a, um, a very useful computer search method. So you can really tell it exactly what you're looking for and it will give you just the options that match this. So this um, has a nice big HD screen. It's 15.6 inches. Um, it has a nice full keyboard, as you can see. It has four gigs of RAM. It has a fine processor. It matched all of our criteria, except it doesn't have um, a solid state drive. It has a, a hard drive, but good enough, close enough to what we needed. So we bought five of them and we had enough money left over to buy five of these wireless mice. And we also have five um, noise reducing headphones that you can check out as well. So once we had these laptops, we had settled the first three criteria. We had a flexible and usable system that is a real computer that can, you can move anywhere 
and it didn't um, break the bank. So now we're going to look at privacy and security. They're related. Privacy is essentially if patron one is using a computer and does their taxes and logs off, and patron two logs on, they shouldn't be able to see patron one's taxes. Security, on the other hand, is essentially protecting the computer and its systems from the patron or from, um, from viruses that may be accidentally downloaded or from changes the patron may have made to the settings to suit their needs. So both of these, in large extent, both of these items are achieved by something called Pharaonix Deep Freeze or a similar program. This is a program that takes a picture of your computer and its systems in its ideal state and saves that. So when you log out, it erases everything you've done to the computer and restores it to that perfect state. The thing about Deep Freeze, and it's a great program, though a little bit tricky sometimes, the, um, it's a great program, but it costs money, and by this time we were out of money. We only had that $1,500. So we needed to figure out another way to make this work. We needed to achieve privacy and security and to do so for free. And this is when we turn to Ubuntu. Ubuntu is a distribution of Linux. It's a version of Linux. It's not an alternative to Deep Freeze. It's an alternative to Windows or Apple. It's an operating system. And this is sort of what sets our laptops apart from a lot of other laptops that libraries are using because it's, it's Linux. It's an open source system. And um, I just want to make it clear that the reason we went with Linux it has a lot of great things going for it. It's open source. It's um, got a great community around it. You can do great things with it. But it's also free, and that's what really did it for us. And it comes packaged with something called um, a temporary guest session. So when you log in as a guest, this screen appears, and there's this little pop-up that says, all the data created during this guest session will be deleted when you log out, and settings will be reset to their default. Please save files on some external device, a USB stick, if you would like to access them again later. So this is perfect. This is exactly what we wanted to have happen with Deep Freeze. Um, patron logs in, they do what they need to do, and they log out, and the computer wipes everything that they've done. And Alex, that's an automatic yeah. thing that comes with it. That's not something like Deep Freeze, some extra you have to get. It just comes with. That's correct. Yeah, that's it nice. Comes yeah. with it. That's really what, what mm -hmm. took us over the edge. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, I've, I've always sort of liked Linux. I think philosophically it's a great choice for libraries because it's, it's affordable and we know it's pretty secure because the data, uh, the source code, you can read it. So you can know that there's nothing, you know, evil lurking in there. But um, this was a really great reason for us to take the leap and go for Linux in a public library. A lot of people have been afraid of it. But when you don't have any money and you need to do this, this is a perfect solution. So the thing about this, though, was um, if you look to the left of the screen here, you see um, a lot of icons. The top one uh, is sort of like your start menu in Windows. The second one is your file system, so if you want to go to My Documents, for example. The next one is Mozilla Firefox. It's a browser. The next three are um, an Office system. And the one below that with an A, followed by the next one with an A, um, it's to get new software for your computer. And the next one is Amazon. And then you have um, the little gear with the wrench. That's your settings. And then the one right below is just this message that's popped up. So I didn't want patrons to have access to all of that. I didn't want them to be able to go into the software um, folder. And I didn't want them to have to go to Amazon this way. It, it sort of feels like an advertisement. And I def definitely didn't want them to have settings right there. If they wanted to change something, I'd rather them talk to the staff, but typically they haven't needed to go into settings. So um, I didn't need, I didn't want to make it available to them. I wanted it as simple as possible. So I would log in as a guest and I would change things and I would want those icons to go away, but then I would log back out and log back in and of course they would go back because that's the whole point of the temporary guest session. So I did some digging on um, Google. I Googled it. Um, because I, I still had to make this work, because we had the computers, Ubuntu was on them, we didn't have any money to really make any changes, so we had to make it work. So I found out that you can customize a guest session, and that sounded good, but it required terminal commands. So terminal is sort of the back end of the system. It's 
um, you're writing in code and you're telling it what to do in a specific computer language that I had no experience with at all. So this really made me nervous. I was feeling like this, I've made this a, an unacceptable solution for my library that I need this high degree of technical information. But some friendly person on the internet had put instructions online. So all I had to do was a little bit more Googling, and then I found a nice little um, walkthrough. And it's, it's about five steps long. So the first step, create a new administrative user and name them guest prefs. You can name them anything you want, but guest prefs is what we chose. So you just go into user accounts um, under your settings tab. It's two clicks away. And you just add a new user. It's the same way you would, do, you would on your phone or on an iPad or um, on Windows or Mac. It's the same thing. So you just create that new user. Then you log in as that user, and you change all the things um, that you want to change. So if you don't want Amazon to be on there, you take it off in, get, in guest press, um, and you do all the changes right there. Then, oh, OK, so I forgot about this slide. So this is what happens when you open a guest session, and I wanted to get rid of those things right at the bottom. So if you look at the left, you can see it was all these things. I wanted to get rid of them. So I went into guest press, and I, I got rid of them. So then, once you've done that, you open terminal and enter these crazy strings of letters. So they now make sense to me because I, I sort of I've entered them so often. But at the time, they were complete gobbledygook. And that's fine because it still works because the computer knows what it means. Um, so you just enter these, and that's it. This makes the guest session mirror the new user you've just created. So if you want um, your patrons to log on and see a desktop pattern that shows your logo, for instance, you can just go into guest prefs, put the, um, the desktop pattern on guest prefs, and log out. And then the guest session will have that logo on the desktop. And you can do um, more intricate changes as well. I haven't really done many of them. Um, but this is the way to make any changes to the guest session. It, it took me about an hour to figure it out, and then it took me about 10 minutes to set it up on all the computers. It was very easy. It was painless. So guest session gives us this level of privacy and security that we would have had to use Deep Freeze for. Um, so Deep Freeze is a deeper solution than what we've done, but it's a sufficient solution for our purposes. We also decided to add a little bit more security um, by going into the BIOS. The BIOS um, is sort of called firmware. It's what's on your computer even if you don't have an operating system. It, it controls the base hardware of your computer. And you get to the BIOS setup. On most computers, you, you turn on your computer and you just press F2 and it will bring you right here. And if I wanted to mess up someone's computer, I would go to BIOS and I would change all the settings and it would, it would totally mess them up. So I could, for instance, tell the computer to, instead of booting from the hard drive, boot from my thumb drive, and I could install a new operating system that would totally mess up the computer. I didn't want people to be able to do that, so we just entered a password for the BIOS, and that gave us another layer of security. So we've protected patrons from losing their information to each other, and we've protected the computer to a sufficient degree from deliberate tampering in this way. Locking the BIOS, yeah, it, it protected us against deliberate tampering. If you still wanted to mess up this computer and you really knew what you were doing, you could still do that, but you can do that on any computer. So this is just um, some basic steps we could take to protect these computers. We wanted to add a bit more privacy, um, and to do so without um, using any money, um, to our browser. And we could do that with free browser add-ons. So we added, we use Mozilla Firefox. It's a great open source browser. I think it's probably the best browser out there. Chrome gives it, gives it a bit of a run for its money, but Chrome is extremely proprietary. So um, Chrome and Firefox are both secure in that they're not going to you know, be robbed, essentially. They're not going to get hacked, probably. But um, the difference between Chrome and Mozilla is that Mozilla isn't really collecting data on you, but, but Google is. Google is collecting data from Chrome. So I like Mozilla. It's it works really well, and it comes prepackaged with Linux, so you don't have to install it. But we put on Privacy Badger. Privacy Badger is an add-on that blocks spying ads and invisible trackers. Um, you might be spied on by corporations or by hackers or, I suppose, by government organizations, um, and this prevents that, or it helps prevent that. 
we also added another program, or another add-on called HTTPS Everywhere. So HTTP stands for Hypertext, uh, Hypertext Transfer Protocol, and the S stands for Secure. Um, it just adds a layer of encryption to everything you do on the web. And so we added that. Um, we have a lot of eBay shoppers in Millis, and so this protects them a little bit. And it was free, so it, that we had no reason not to. We also switched the default search engine from Google to DuckDuckGo. Um, you can sort of think of, you know, Chrome is to Mozilla as Google is to DuckDuckGo. They're both search engines, but um, DuckDuckGo doesn't track you, and Google makes most of its money off advertisements, and it, it does a good job of that because it tracks you. So uh, an example of the difference between these two is that if you look up Home Depot on Google, it'll give you directions from your house to the closest Home Depot. And if you look it up on um, DuckDuckGo, it'll bring you to homedepot.com. So it's certainly convenient to get those directions right away, but it's sort of creepy to know that it knows exactly where you are. Um, it also does this cool thing. So if, if you Google download McAfee, McAfee is an antivirus protection program. In Google, it gives you three ads right at the top. Um, the first one is from McAfee.com, and then the bottom one is McAfee.offers.com, and then the one in between is McAfee-antivirus-download.com, which is a pretty sketchy URL. Um, it, I don't, I wouldn't recommend anyone go to that middle one, maybe to the, t the top one, maybe to the bottom one, but definitely not the middle one. It doesn't seem safe. If you do the same thing, okay, I showed a different search here, but if you search something in um, DuckDuckGo, it'll find the official site and it will put a little label there that says this is the official site. And so if people are looking to download things, you know, um, they could be downloading programs to use, they'll be erased shortly after, uh, or if they're downloading documents or other things, um, they could very well download something they don't want to download. Privacy, um, DuckDuckGo will tell them when they're in a safe spot, and we like that. And um, uh, since I've looked this up, I can say Privacy Badger is created by the EFF, that's the uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation. It's sort of like the ACLU of the internet. Um, so it created Privacy Badger and it created HTTP, HTTPS everywhere. They're both great, reliable products. Another thing, and just because I'm talking to a bunch of librarians, I'll mention this, DuckDuckGo has some cool tricks up its sleeve. So if you type in Dewey and history or Dewey and satire, it'll give you Dewey call numbers that have to do with those topics, which is really handy if you're at the front desk and someone asks you a question and um, you need a, a broad answer. I find this pretty helpful. Wow. Were librarians involved in creating DuckDuckGo? <laughs> I don't think they were, actually. Um, but, you know, nice. I think it's Dewey.info um, has been down for years now. Yes. Yeah, I know. I've seen a lot of people having it, yeah, worry they want it back, yeah. It was very handy, especially, mm -hmm. you know, I have a great ILS at my library, but occasionally um, it's kind of slow, and DuckDuckGo is faster. So if I need to do a quick search, that's much easier for me. While we were messing around with Firefox, we decided to change a couple other things. For instance, one of the problems we see most often is a patron will download something, you know, a document, and then they can't find it. So they come to the desk and say, I just, I just saved this. Where did it go? And... Um, it, it goes to the My Documents folder by default, depending on the computer you're using. But we decided to change it so that everything you download goes right to the desktop, because people know how to find the desktop. So um, that has made things a lot easier. Um, so between these five things, I put a little asterisk at usability, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, we have a flexible, usable, affordable, relatively private, and relatively secure system. Now we need a data e-system. Oh, I guess we're going to talk about the asterisks first. Um, so one thing that we don't have on these laptops is Microsoft Office, which is probably the most requested program any library has. Um, again, Microsoft Office costs money, and we had run out. But we still wanted to satisfy our patrons' needs, so we turned to LibreOffice which is a sort of a Microsoft Office clone that comes with Linux. It's a great program. I use it personally, um, and I love it. So it has um, a document creation. Well, it has essentially Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Access, 
and um, publisher, I think. I never used anything but the top three. Um, the thing about it is that it uses different file formats. Uh, Microsoft Office uses .doc and other proprietary formats. And um, by default, LibreOffice uses .odf, which is open document format. And in the past, there have been some real issues about conversion. Um, sometimes it's difficult for LibreOffice to open a .doc, and um, it was definitely difficult for Microsoft Office to open LibreOffice files. It just wouldn't work. But again, we didn't have any money to buy Microsoft Office, and we needed to make this work. So I did some more Googling, and I found out that if I went into LibreOffice, and I went into Tools, and selected Options, and went to Always Save As, I could just tell LibreOffice to always use Microsoft Office formats. For no money, um, we can have LibreOffice basically think that it's Microsoft Office. And I thought this was far too good to be true. So I used one of these laptops as my work laptop exclusively for two weeks. And I never had a single conversion issue, even though I was using um, LibreOffice's version of Word and of PowerPoint, uh, PowerPoint and of Excel. Very importantly, I was using Excel. And I never had any problems. So a few years ago, that wouldn't have been possible, but now it really is. The conversion issue has really um, gone away for the most part. While we were messing around with LibreOffice, um, we wanted to do the same thing that we did for Firefox. So we went back into Tools, we went to Options, and we went to Paths, and we told it to, instead of saving to My Documents, to also set, save to the desktop. So now everything that a patron's gonna be doing on these computers will um, be based around the desktop. Our browser's on the desktop, our um, office suite is on the desktop, and now all the files will be on the desktop too, so they don't have to go hunting around, which is really great. So now um, we've achieved these five items. So now we're on to data eat. And what I mean by that is usage statistics. I don't want to know where people have been going on the internet. I don't want to know how often they're using, um, you know, LibreOffice, um, Word, rather than its version of Excel. That doesn't really matter to me so much. Uh, but I do want to know how many times the computers are used in a year, because in Massachusetts we have to report that. It's important to, um, you know, to assess our, our library's value, essentially. So we wanted a way to find out how to, um, to do that. So traditionally this is done by having patrons have to log into the computer with their library card. So they would enter their library card into the computer, it would connect to a server, that would check that um, number against your ILS. So it'd say, is this the right person? And if it wasn't, it would say, try again. And if it would say, okay, come on in. And then if I wanted that information, I would have to log into that server and download that information. And that's sort of a pain, and it's ex an expensive pain. I would have had to come up with an authentication system for these laptops. And I would have to connect them to our ILS which is on its own network, so I'd have to do this whole bridging situation. So instead, I just slapped a barcode on them and I added them to our ILS. So now, um, when someone wants one of these laptops, they hand their card to a staff member. The staff member scans their card, gives them back their card, scans the computer, and gives them the computer. And when I want, um, when I want that usage data, I can just download it from my ILS. It's very simple, it's cost no money, and um, it was incredibly easy. It was very satisfying when we figured this out because it was a huge problem and we managed to get around it for no money and very little effort. So those are our six items. And um, we feel pretty good about it. So now um, we did this in fiscal year 15. We're in fiscal year 16. We were able to already buy those laptops. And probably over the summer we're gonna buy the next five, um, which is really great. And so now, um, we're seeing people using these laptops all over the building. The teens love them. Um, they love them so much that we're thinking about moving their desktops out of their teen room and just giving them more empty desk space so they can use the laptops more exclusively. And we're also able to turn our program room, which is essentially a big empty room, into uh, a computer lab in about two minutes, which is really great. We were able to offer computer classes, resume workshops, we're able to have a code camp. We're actually having one this uh, Saturday. And we're able to have Minecraft parties, which is really exciting. It's a great way to get teens in the building. 
Um, and we weren't able to do any of that without um, laptop. So we're on this path. We're going to get five more and hopefully five more after that, and we'll have 20, and that will really fill up our program room. We'll have a nice big computer lab when we need it. Um, and then in 2019, we're going to think about replacing or upgrading our fiscal year 15 laptops. And typically, uh, if you have the money to do it, it's a good idea to replace computers or upgrade computers after about three years. And I'm pretty confident that we're going to get at least four years out of these laptops. And that's because Windows uses more computing power than Ubuntu does. So if I had Windows 10 on these laptops three years from now, it would really be struggling, I think, to run Windows. Windows sort of builds up errors over time, and Windows will have an upgrade to Windows that will require more power um, even than the power listed here. But Ubuntu is fairly consistently light. So Ubuntu will last on these laptops longer than Windows would. So I, I'm pretty confident we'll get four or five years out of these laptops, barring someone dropping them, which hasn't happened. So now, um, this is our program room. We can put laptops in it. We can have classes really easily. Here I'm set up to give an introduction to our e-library. Um, the class hadn't started yet. Just, just know that. People did come. Um, and we're able to use them all over the building. So what would I do differently if I were looking back on it? Well, I would not buy wireless mice. They're really a pain in the neck. They have to have this little hub that you plug into the USB, and that hub will only work on a specific mouse. So if you have two mice and you mix them up, it's really a pain to track them down. And if someone, um, well, they also they use batteries, and the batteries go out all the time, especially if you accidentally leave the mouse on. You'll just drain your batteries all the time. So it's a huge pain in the neck. We wanted to avoid wires, but I think it wasn't worth it. We would just get wired mice going forward. I would also use Ubuntu LTS, which is um, every six months, Ubuntu releases a new updated version of it. So people who are sort of power users can always have the latest version. But most people's needs are met by having um, one version for two years. That's the LTS, the long-term. Um, so I didn't do that. I used 14, uh, 1504, which was the latest version at the time. And now it's out of date. And um, I think that was a mistake, because I'm going to have to upgrade those all. So I'm going to upgrade to the LTS, and that'll be good for two years. Um, so our next steps, this is what I'm talking about. Uh, each version of Ubuntu has a little animal associated with it. Um, 16.10, I think that's what we're about to go to, or 16.04 is the long-term service. It has a little squirrel. So we're going to be upgrading to the squirrel one. Um, I'm also going to play around with accessibility. Linux does, does have some things built into it that will um, help people who are low vision or low hearing um, use the computers. So I'm going to play around with that. I'm going to see if I can add a second guest session and that one would be for people who um, you know, want accessibility services turned on. And I am going to continue to think about adding Word to this. We haven't had anyone complain that we don't have Word, but I think we are still getting people who are a little bit more adventurous using the laptops um, than the people who are comfortable using the desktops exclusively. Um, it used to be quite difficult to add Word to um, Linux. It, you had to use a program called Wine which was sort of a layer that would make Linux pretend it was Windows. And then you would, so you, you would turn Wine on, and then inside Wine, Wine would turn Office on. And it was this slow, tricky thing to use, and it was always a few years out of date. Um, but now there's a program called Play on Linux, which uses Wine, but it adds a front end to it, and it makes it much easier to install Word. So I installed Word on my own computer as a test, because uh, I actually prefer LibreOffice, using Play on Linux. And um, it took me 10 minutes to install. It was much easier. So I think we, we will experiment with that if we have the funds for it. Um, we've also been doing setups and updates manually, laptop by laptop. The first time I did one of these setups, it took me about an hour for one laptop. And after that, it took me about 30 minutes per laptop. And most of that was just waiting around. Um, and now that we're set up, I can update all of the computers in one go simply by turning them all on and standing in front of them. And it takes me about half an hour to do all of them. So that's not too bad. But it would be convenient to just have to set up one computer 
and have it set up all the other computers. So we can use something like Clonezilla that will do that for us. Um, you can also, um, related just to updates, I could train my staff to run the updates for me. But I have a small staff, a very busy staff, and I really want these computers to be self-contained. Um, so I'd like to do something like Ansible, which will automatically um, update your computers. This is much higher level work, setting Ansible up. Um, I essentially set up these laptops the way you would set up your own laptop, just to work individually. And that made it very easy to set these up. Ansible, I would have to sort of connect them to this cloud-based system. If you're interested in that, Chuck McAndrew from the Lebanon, New Hampshire Library um, wrote a piece on how to do this. And he did, a, I think, a much more sophisticated job setting up his Linux system than I did here. Um, that wasn't an accident. Um, Chuck has much greater tech skills than I do, uh, but he's also in a much larger library, and his job is, um, I believe, it's entirely technology, and my job is only a little bit technology. So I need a system that would work um, without uh, a dedicated technologist. But if you're interested in that, um, this is a great resource here. I'm also going to be looking into um, time management systems for these laptops. Um, LibKey is an open source kiosk management system where you would log in with your library card. Um, you can also have it managed for you, so we're going to look into that. I would also really like to have a laptop vending machine or automatic checkout. We have self-checkout machines here, but we don't use them for the laptops. You have to actually talk to a staff member to get the laptops. And we've gotten feedback from our team that, um, you know, sometimes they don't want to interact with the scary staff members. They just want to be self-contained, get their laptop, and do their work as, as they need, um, which I think is a reasonable thing. So this is something that we're going to look into, and then we're going to immediately find out that it's far, far too expensive for us. But we might be able to figure something out. Um, I'd also like to circulate laptops um, outside of the library. We circulate a lot of weird things at the library. Um, we have Lego sets and um, Raspberry Pis and sewing machines and ukuleles and all sorts of things. Um, we actually just got a Roomba the other day, so it's a little robot vacuum that people can try out at home. Um, I think it would be really neat to, to circulate laptops because we do have a small population that doesn't have um, computers at home, and I think this would really be useful. And it's not too expensive. Um, we're also still working on um, our Minecraft program. So we are having Minecraft parties, but um, we don't currently let people, we don't have Minecraft installed on these individual computers all the time. So we're, um, we're going to have to figure that out. I think that would be a really great thing. Um, so that's, that's it for me. Um, I, I hope people find this useful, and I hope they, they start using Linux laptops. There are a couple libraries near us that have started after um, talking to us, and I think it's a really great thing. It's an affordable, um, easy way to really improve your patron technology, and it lets you get much more out of your limited space than desktop computers do. So thanks for listening, and um, I do have a quick start guide up on my website, aliceclint.org. Um, feel free to check that out, and feel free to talk to me on Twitter if you have any questions. Thanks. Great. Okay. Um, thanks, Alex. Uh, yes. And so, so everyone knows as you're going through your presentation, as I do every week, um, I've been grabbing all the ones, all the websites that you've mentioned, all the resources and things that have websites, grabbing them to save um, all of their links in when we do the recording up for you guys later. So um, hopefully I've got all of them. Um, didn't miss any. I'll check again later. <laughs> um, so you'll have access to that. Uh, Let's see. We do have a few questions about um, about this. Uh, I had a question about um, using the laptops. I know some people do have um, don't like using laptops because of their size, um, the, specifically the keyboard being um, smaller yeah. um, for for people with larger hands. Um, have you had any issues with that? I know you mentioned the mouse thing that you actually did get separate mice, which I think is great because I personally don't like touchpads. They drive me batty. <laughs> right. Um, we, um, I had one patron in mind who really wants as quiet a space as she can possibly get. Uh -huh. and I thought they would be a great candidate to take a laptop and a mouse and go into a study room. And that really, um, that didn't interest this patron at all. They, they like the really big computer and they like the full size uh, keyboard. Mm. Um, 
So we have, you know, the, the computers we got do have um, the sort of standard large size screen. It's 15.6 inches, which is pretty comfortable. And they mm -hmm. do have the full size keyboard okay. or as full size as a laptop can get. But um, yeah, we have had, uh, you know, one person who wasn't mm -hmm. interested based on size. Nah, not bad. <laughs> No, um, not not bad. Um, we get about twenty thousand uses of our computers a year, so mm -hmm. you know if we have one one person uh, not like them. That's okay. Well, it's yeah. not okay, but it's pretty good. Yeah, um, and you did mention speaking of statistics that you um, did the you, you know the, check out the laptops using their computer your you know circulation system to track how often they're getting used, which totally you know makes sense. Um, but that you didn't want to know, of course, where are they going on the internet? Do you have anything though to see? Um, are they using the different services that the programs you've installed onto them to at least to figure out, oh, are they using Office enough or is there something else they're not using that we've put on here? Do you have anything that you're using to keep track of that kind of information? At least just not what they've actually done, but what they've clicked on to try and use that well, kind of usage. Um, I think there's probably something we could add um, mm -hmm. to figure that out, but um, we don't need it for the reports that we, we have to file and um, mm -hmm. it's, yeah. That's some information that we don't. Yeah, and I would hope your users, if they if there was something that wasn't on there that they wanted, they would tell you. That's the hope. Hopefully, um, are, <laughs> yeah. The ones that aren't ones afraid of the scary librarians. <laughs> right. Yeah. So we have gotten some feedback um, that way. We got that sort of through the grapevine. You know, the, the people mm -hmm. spoke to our children's librarian who spoke to me, and um, so we're trying to figure that out. But yeah, that that is the hope, and it's sort of a passive way to figure this out, which is unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we are going to be launching um, a sort of constant set of groups. You know, not just teen advisory boards, but also for all other groups. And hopefully, we'll be able to talk to them about the things that they would want. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we do have one question from the audience. Wanted to know: um, Could you please list again the programs that you can now do use more easily using the laptops? Like, I guess, what are the different things you have installed on there? Do they mean programs or events? Good question. Um, so I can, Debbie, I can do you mean the actual things. like events that they've held, like like events? Yes, she means the events. Yeah, actual that kind okay. of programs. Yeah. Yeah. So we have um, a monthly computer class, and the topic varies. Um, so some of the topics are, you know, basic computing, you know, computing 101, setting up a Facebook account, all these sort of things like that. We also have classes on. Um, using the library's online resources like Overdrive and things like that. And uh, the computers have made that easier because some of our um, our resources are really web-based. Overdrive is really app-based at this point. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, we also have classes on setting appropriate passwords. And we have computer camps. Um, so people who want to learn how to um, you know, write computer code, we're, we're able to do that now. And we do have uh, Minecraft parties, which is really exciting. Yeah. We also have... Um, resume workshops where we're getting some people in to do that from the local um, business office. And so none of those were at all possible before unless people brought in their own laptops. And, and some people just don't have laptops. So this has made direct instruction a lot easier. Mm -hmm. um, you had mentioned about um, thinking about letting them take these home. Right now they're just for use in the library, correct? That's correct, yeah. Right. Do you do any programs, um, I suppose, I'd say on the road, like taking some of them outside to another another location, doing a program elsewhere, or is everything just done at the library itself? Right now, everything's done at the library. Um, when I came here, we had um, not enough programming happening, so mm. the first step we took was to just really beef up our, our in-house stuff. But I think there is an opportunity to go to some organizations and, and do classes. Especially now that you have the laptops, which are way more portable. Yeah, it wouldn't yeah. have been possible at all before that, but no. um, now it is potential. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we do have another question that just came in. Um, can you say a little bit more about how an accessibility guest session um, would differ from the current regular guest sessions when they switch to that? Sure. Yes. So um, there are options where you can have, well, basically everything bigger, and you can also have icons be high contrast, and you can have the computer um, speak to you. I'm not an expert in mm -hmm. accessibility, so this is um, early days for me in knowing about this. 
Um, and we do have the Perkins School in Massachusetts, which works with low vision people. And I would, um, if we do move forward on this, I'm going to ask them for help. Mm -hmm. But um, it's essentially a large screen, uh, a large print version. And then there are more advanced versions as well. So the reason it's tricky is because I know how to set up a single guest session, the one that looks um, sort of like your standard computer. I'd want to also offer additional guest sessions. So one would be, you know, the standard look. One would be um, low vision. One would be low hearing. You know, all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know how to set up multiple guest sessions at this point. Right. Yeah, for accessibility, we do that here um, to the commission with helping libraries with that. Um, screen viewers that make things bigger, um, text, to, text to speech software, there is software that you can get that and it does cost. I'm sure there'll be something to look into for something that doesn't cost too much um, think that will read off of the screen for people who can't, even the increased size of the screens isn't enough for. So I believe some of that is available open source. On mm -hmm. Oh yeah. We could, we could do it for free. Um, and that is something that we're interested in, yeah. Great, okay. Uh, let's see, any other last minute questions? We're almost about five of the 11 here in central time. So um, we could wrap up. Anybody have anything, anything else that you want to ask before we do end for today? Could people got some of their questions out while we were chatting, which is great, and during the show. Um, while we're waiting, I do get a lot. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> um, a lot of people ask uh, what version of Linux we use, and I, I did mention we use mm. Ubuntu, um, and we chose that because it's really the biggest, most popular version of Ubuntu uh, of Linux. Oh. The I think Linux Mint is another version. I think it's better um, than Ubuntu. It's much more polished, and it's based on Ubuntu. Mm -hmm. But Ubuntu is easy to set up. And you can have your desktop be very plain and just have exactly what you want on it. And so it was very easy for us to go with Ubuntu. So in Lebanon, they used um, Mint, which I think is a, a beautiful version. I use, I use Mint personally, um, but Ubuntu was very stable and very easy to set up, which is why we went with that. Um, we do have another question that just came in, actually. Um, is our five of these, you said you got five now, are they actually really enough for your population? Um, or is the idea that after three years of buying five each year, you're going to eventually have 15? I mean, how is five doing right now? We have 10. So we oh, have 10 now, okay. Um, right at the end of fiscal year 15. Okay, so you're already on your second year, right? Yeah, so we bought five, I think, just about this time last year. And then two months went by and we had a new budget, so we bought five more. And so I'm about to buy... Uh, actually, when we when we switch to the next year, so in a couple months, I'll buy five more, and then we'll have 15. Um, so five was not enough. No. Um, Ten is – it was okay for the first year because people didn't really know about them at first. Mm. Um, it's not enough for our classes. And um, my long-term hope is to really not have a lot of desktop computers because I think um, – you know, I really do think the laptops are better. We're getting much more out of our building. And um, so that's what I'd like to see in the long run. I don't know if that'll really fly with my trustees, but. <laughs> Some are, of them still want the traditional, one. yeah. And there's like that one patron that doesn't want, that wants the big one. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's totally reasonable. Um, I think it's possible in a few years we'll be able to maybe go down to 12 desktops um, or maybe even 10. But we'll see. You know, we do have our current setup with the bank of computers and um, it's going pretty well. So we're not in desperate need anymore to free up those desks, mm -hmm. but we'll see. And we're going to get up to 20 computers and then we'll, we'll reassess. Mm. Um, someone wants to know also, do you have, have you done anything with tablets or iPads in the library or do you just do have desktops and laptops? We have desktops and laptops and then we circulate um, Kindle fires. Ah, okay. But, uh, we have staff iPads. Um, to get staff up to speed on them. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think it would be nice to have more iPads around, especially in the, the children's room. We have a, mm -hmm. a neighboring library that has done some really great things by just having iPads in their children's room. It's patron, patrons of that age have really responded well. They do, yeah. It's a very, they're really great for the kids to learn on. They, they are all about that touch screen, and they just whiz through that stuff. Um, it's easier for them, I think, the younger they are, to do that than trying to use, 
even though the, the even the children's based computers with the keyboards and whatnot. Yeah, that's exactly right. All right. Any other questions we have? Um, while we're waiting, I'll say yes. As I said, I've grabbed all the all the links for everyone. Um, Alex, the slides normally um, sometimes we post them along with the recording. Um, would you? Be you okay with that? You can either send me them or I can link to somewhere where you have them post on time, on, on, oh, posted sure. online, whichever works for you. We're not particular. We have a slide share account that we use here. That's fine. But, um, I can send them to you as well. Okay, no problem. All right, we'll have the slides afterwards as well for anyone who wants to go back and see what he had done here. Oh, oh somebody wants to know which is that library that near you that has the iPads for the kids' room. <laughs> uh, the Dover Town Library. Okay. Um, which is a very good library. There are a few libraries that have them, you know, and mm -hmm. will have them pretty soon. Yeah. But um, Dover um, is, a, is one of our closest neighbors, and I'm, I'm happy to brag about them on their behalf. <laughs> yeah. So that'd be Dover, Massachusetts. Yeah. Yep. So I think it's DoverTownLibrary.org. Cool. All right. Anything else before we wrap up? Got a lot of thank yous coming through. It's good. <laughs> oh, good. If, good if you um, have any questions later on, I'm I'm very accessible on Twitter, and you can email me at alex at alexlent.org. I'm um, very happy to get into the nitty gritty detail of um, of this with you. Right. I, I do think that Linux is a great option for libraries. It's it's cheap and it gives you so much control that you really can do um, almost everything you need to do just with Linux. You don't have to get all these additional programs. Right, and that makes it much easier to just figure out one thing. And I especially like what you said at the very beginning, which I hope a lot of people caught, that you don't have to be a techie type person to do this. You 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 were kind of thrown into having to do this, um, and you you pulled it off without having you know you don't have to have a computer science degree or be the the yeah. IT person for the city who who knows how to do all these things. Yeah, absolutely. You know. Um... My undergraduate degree is in philosophy, and my first library job was cataloging cookbooks. So um, <laughs> I have technology skills now, but most mm -hmm. of them have come from projects like this where I just have to figure it out. Right. And the nice thing about Linux is that there's this great community where, you know, sometimes I'll just tweet out a question and someone will get back to me in 30 seconds with the answer. Mm -hmm. And um, also, it's very difficult to, well, I shouldn't say that. It's pretty tricky to really break your computer just with software. Um, yeah. Yeah. Pretty much, you know, if you mess up Linux, you can just delete it and reinstall. Start over. Mm -hmm. You're back on. Yeah. Um, oh, one question to just pop in. Um, I don't know if you mentioned this. Do you are your laptops able to send um to print in the library? They're they are they like wireless networked into your printer system? Yes. Great yeah. question. So um, they are, and one of the great things about Linux is that it handles drivers really well. Mm. So it's in incredibly easy to set up Linux to work with just about any printer, which is mm -hmm. fabulous. And we have, um, yeah, we have wireless printing here, so you can just connect to it. Um, we also have a setup so you can email your documents to the printer. So, uh, oh, nice. That's great, yeah. Is that something that was like came with the printer, or that some sort of separate program? Uh, we chose, that work? we went with HP because they built it. Ah, they have that built in, the, yeah. yeah. Cool. All and right. small enough that we can get away with it. <laughs> yeah. All right. We're a little after 11. I think we'll wrap it up for this morning's show. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Thank you so much, Alex. This is great. I'm glad that you, uh, I, people don't know, Alex had reached out to me originally about doing this on our um, Big Talk from Small Libraries online conference that we do in the spring. I then was unable to join us that day um, with scheduling issues. Um, so I said, not a problem. We've got other options. <laughs> we'll get you out, your, out there anyways. <laughs> Thank you for having me, and thanks for being patient with the schedule issue. Oh, not a problem at all. We're very flexible here. All right, so thank you very much, Alex. Thank you, everyone, for attending. I'm going to pull back presenter control to my screen here now. There we go. Get rid of this. All right, and as I said, I've been um, saving the links into our delicious account here. Um, I'll go back and double check when I get your slides to see if I missed anything. Um, those will be here. Um, and our recording will be posted onto our website, our Encompass Live website. Come on.
There we go. Um, what we have here is our upcoming shows, but right beneath there is a link to our archived Encompass Live sessions. You'll be able to go here. Let me see last week's show. Yep, our recording goes on YouTube. The presentation, when I get it, will be on SlideShare, and all of our links will be there. So you'll have the same kind of thing for today's show. Um, will be list posted here onto our archive sessions probably by the sometime this afternoon, depending on how long the it goes, it takes to process everything. Um, so that wraps it up for this week's show. I hope you join us for next week when we are doing um, the University of Press collection, a University of, Bra University of Nebraska Press, um, the books that they have here that we collect here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Mary Sowers, who's our government info services librarian, and our new cataloging librarian, Allison Badger, will be on the show with us to talk about the, the books that we have here, history of the Nebraska University of Nebraska Press. So if you're um, interested in that, definitely do um, join us for next week's show and you can see all of our other upcoming shows are listed here as well we're always adding new ones as we go along so sign up for any of those also we are on Facebook if you are a big Facebook user please do pop over there and like our page on Facebook and and you can well, let me get rid of this yeah I better set it up there um, I post when our new shows are coming up. Um, here's a reminder for today's show to log in on the fly for people when our recordings are available. There we go. I post that on here as well. So definitely do, um, if you're big on Facebook, give us a like over there to keep up with what we're doing on Encompass Live. Other than that, Can I that... give a brief yeah. shout out? To oh, go ahead. Our, yes. Um, upcoming talk. The one on um, June 15th with Jessamine West is going to be awesome. I was in Vermont when they started the Passport. Oh, Library. really? Okay. So it's really neat. Okay. Great. Yes, yes. Um, I just got that book today. <laughs> As right before this show, I confirmed it with her. Um, this is something I actually read. There was an article about this last fall in um, the Computers and Libraries magazine. Um, yeah. And then I saw – I'm friends with Jessamine on Facebook. Um, and she's been here actually to Nebraska for other events that we've had in the past. Um, she was involved in our um, technology things that we've done here. Um, and I saw that she said they're doing it again, and I jumped and sent her an email yesterday, and today she said, yes, of course. So, yeah, um, this is a great program. They're gonna, She's going to be on with us to talk about this uh, visit all your libraries just because they're fun. <laughs> yep. I'm sure there's more to it than that. Yeah. Um, are you guys thinking about doing that in your state or um, no? Not yet. <laughs> I'm know? just a fan of um, the idea. Yeah, yeah. Um, we try, like I say, as you see, we we do try to do a mixture of things here on the show. Nebraska things, Kevin come from, from in Vermont. Uh, I'm trying to think, remember what all these other ones are for? Oh, this is from one of our schools, a school, our ESU Educational Service Unit, talking about blended learning in school libraries. So, a little of something for everybody. I'm hoping. Great. So, thanks a lot, Alex. Um, maybe you'll join us to watch that one or watch a recording if you want to. <laughs> Go ahead and register for it. So that will wrap it up for today. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending, and we'll see you next time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye.